So I think we are ready to start. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? Nice. So hi, good morning, and I'm really happy that like it's a complete like full session almost. Uh, what I wanted to do before we start is that is it okay for me to take a picture all of all of us together? Awesome. So this is my way of remembering that I came here. <laughs> so no, bad idea. <laughs> Better. Right. So hi everybody. Good morning. Uh, today we are gonna talk about something which I have termed as turning senses into signatures. So this is kind of like a side project, kind of a hobby project, which uh, me and uh, Dietrich Ayala from Mozilla uh, started working in our free time, and then we stumbled into something interesting, and we thought, okay, why not share it with people, and maybe they can take it forward. So first, I'm uh, Ravimba Koranjai. Uh, I'm right now a student. I'm uh, doing my PhD in uh, Rice University, Houston. And I also volunteer with Mozilla. Uh, the things I used to do once upon a time was Firefox OS. Uh, I used to do something in the keyboard module, prediction kind of stuff, which got shipped up eventually. Then I started working a little bit into a connected devices team, IoT team of Mozilla, which also got shut down. So now essentially I'm working a little bit in with virtual reality, with the virtual reality team. That also is part of uh, <coughs> something I'm doing in my uh, research for PhD. Uh, in a little bit parallelization, speeding things up, but that's a different thing. That's me and that's a Foxy, uh, that's Mozilla's Foxy. <coughs> so today we're gonna talk about what's going on into the IoT space and what we can do to go out of the world bubble that IoT is slowly becoming. Now, how many of you have actually started or just did an experimentation or just wanted to do something in IoT? Oh, lots of, not lots, some middle, 50 50. Okay, so right now there are a lot of things going on in IoT. There are development boards, there are cloud services which you can connect to and talk to, there are many libraries you can use for your own project. There are boards like Raspberry Pi, there are Arduino, a lot of new things are coming up, and it's easier to go and invest in it. Now, there's a war going on for your mind. <laughs> when I do it, I mean that whenever you have a new, you heard about a new product, you heard about Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Zero, some new platform, Particle I.O., something, everyone, like, you want, okay, I want to know what that is. I want to know how to work on that, or maybe in my free time, I, wa I, I want to do something about it. But as a dev student, I have probably a little more time than other people, but not really. As a developer, how much time do you get? In a whole, like, five days you are working, we are working, and in the Saturday, Sunday, week, weekend, come out, with, with some little amount of time, we try to invest in learning something, and like maybe turn that LED on and off, and that takes quite a lot, big bit of learning. Then next weekend comes a new technology, and we're like, okay, that is supposed to make my life more easier, and I invest more time. Every bit of technology takes more time to learn, there's a curve, not all of them even talk to each other. They're not interoperable. Now, a lot of these things are very high cost investment. Uh, if you are gonna talk, if you are gonna build a product, and if you like do uh, like a small hack or some small hack project or something, maybe the low cost thing I can think of is maybe buy a Raspberry Pi, maybe buy and buy zero, which is like a five dollar thing, and or a Raspberry Pi thirty five dollar thing, and then I start building up things. Now a Pi itself is not that much useful. You need to get inputs in, right? So you need sensors. So you buy sensors, eventually the cost adds up. Eventually you end up with a board or like a project which was supposed to be a small low cost project, which ends up being like a hundred dollar project, something like that. And you invest a lot of time building it, but 
is that really reusable? Will you be able to use it for other projects or what you have built? Maybe, may not be. And not only all of that, when we want to do that, we are investing time. But if we just want to like buy something and I really buy it, just imagine you are buying a Google Home or Alexa or some other IoT device projects. Now, you are actually investing money to buy something. You are also investing in the ecosystem. Just imagine about something not even remotely that much hacky. Imagine something about your Fitbit. How many of you, uh, do any of you have a Fitbit? Awesome. Now, uh, just to be like a few months ago, we got to know, not even now months, uh, that uh, Fitbit won't be supporting it anymore. Oh, sorry, not Fitbit, it was Pebble. I was, sorry, that's bad for me. So uh, Pebble won't be supporting the Pebble watch anymore. Now you're stuck with a product which you cannot upgrade anymore unless you do specific hacks on it and things like that. So you are investing in a closed ecosystem. Now, this is kind of the space we are now in. So there is a maker and do-it-yourself space, and there is a more commercialized, polished product. So if you are more into the maker and do-it-yourself space, then you are going to probably build your project, but probably you are going to build something where you invest your time, invest some amount of money, and build something which uh, solves your <coughs> problem, maybe. But so what are the problems in it? So you, you probably will build something which is mostly customized to your need, which might not be usable to other people. Also, the code you probably will publish open source in GitHub or somewhere, which might not be maintained, and a lot of other problems. And a lot of these products are mostly pro projects built for like specific needs, not too much reusable. On the right hand side, we have like more commercialized products like Amazon Echo, HomeKit, Nest, <coughs> even surprisingly G now even coming with Predix and everything. They're giving you a platform where you can connect, do your data analysis, a lot of things, a lot of interesting, cool things, but you have no idea what is going on with your data. And so the most interesting thing about it, IoT devices is these data are very like a lot of these data are very personal to you. And you might not like this data to go to some other people where you have no idea what is going on with the data. Some of the Kickstarter start, uh, startup projects, mostly Kickstarter projects have put it in between because they mostly start with okay and you are gonna get it something and you have more flexibility on what is going on. But essentially when the scale up, it slowly goes to the more commercial polished market and again, you lose access to what's going on. But my point is, there is no internet of things. There are people like us, there are problems. Some real world, some persist, but there are problems. Now there is air, there is dirt, and there are radio waves. And there are a lot of other things. But what can we do with these? And what can we do with the things we already have without investing too much cost and in an open space. Now, what is the IoT device that will rule it all? That will rule your, might be Google Home or Alexa or anything else, or a Raspberry Pi project. So these are the devices we already have. When I was going to my home and uh, when I was thinking that, okay, my, uh, I have these many devices, all of them are connecting to the internet, essentially devices connecting to the internet, and so they don't share data in between <coughs> them. None of them really talk to each other, they don't do anything. Now, the phone I am carrying right now, it has a lot of things, it, it has a lot of sensors in it. It gathers a lot of data when I am carrying it with me. It knows more about my behavior than any other devices. Then, what can we do about it? Now, the different product categories we have are home, medical, science, industrial, and a lot of other things. We're specifically gonna talk about mostly what you can do in home with it, and maybe somebody can 
do more. So who are our people and what are their problems? So me being a grad student, I have my specific set of problems, and I thought, why not do something about them? So these are my real problems. I'm not really worried about my shopping list. I'm worried about my shopping list, but not something that Alexa can help me with. Uh, most of my groceries and stuff. So I don't have enough money, so I cannot buy fancy devices. I don't have enough time. Being in grad school, you always have something or other, your advisors <coughs> breathing on you, something going on. I'm hungry, lonely, and there is somebody maybe sick, my friend, or in my family. I'm also, so I'm from India, I'm away from home, I want to keep checking on my parents, or if they're all right, and everything, and it's very easy, I mean, it would have been very easy if I had a way to do that without every time calling them and, how are you, and it, yeah, it goes on. Now, all my government is hunting me, might not be true, might be true. So, these are my real problems. Can I solve this with what I have, with limited money, with the devices I already have? Now, this is 2017. Almost all of us have at least one or two phones in, like, which we are not using, my old phones, smartphones, which are lying around in home. So I already have like my old Nexus 4, which is which was sitting just in the uh, my drawer. And also, when I first started working in Firefox OS, we were given a Flame, a developer device that was awesome. I was so excited. And now, since we are not shipping phones or Firefox OS anymore, that device mostly collects dust. And since that only does Firefox OS, there's not much use of it. Or is it? So. Like I said, automated shopping list doesn't come to my real priority problem. So I thought, what to do? Now, my phone has a lot of sensors. What if I can turn those sensors, the data it's getting, to something actionable? For example, I am at work. I want to know the power of my went, uh, power went out in my home. So my phone already has a plethora of sensors, but it also has basic things. For example, if I keep my uh, phone home and plug it in, in charger, and leave the home, and in HTML, just using a JavaScript, a web app, essentially, I can see uh, if it's just connected or not. I can see more, I can get my battery notification, battery status, but I can at least monitor if it's connected to power or not. So there is no reason actually to, to, be, to be disconnected other than I have a power cut or somebody disconnect my phone, both of those are useful information for me. And if I am at college or school and I get those notifications that, okay, something happened, that means, okay, any of these two possibilities. Now let's drill down what more I can do. This brings to my second possibility. So right now I'm away from my home, I'm away from my room, and I want to know if there is somebody, something is going on, if somebody is in my room or not. So there are a lot of ways we can do that. So the screenshot kind of shows you that a new Bluetooth device has been detected. So Bluetooth is a very interesting thing. Just give me an estimate. If I just turn my Bluetooth on, scan, how many Bluetooth devices will I find here? Yeah. Ideally, we don't generally keep our Bluetooth devices on, but apparently a lot of people do. <laughs> and you know the most interesting thing? Blue devices, we can change the names that, okay, something, something, something. But a lot of iPhones come with username, Alan's iPhone, someone's iPhone. That's the default if you don't change it. And that's a useful information to me. Going outside of your phone. These are not going to any server. They are not getting stored anywhere else apart from your phone. And everything you are doing with the web app, which you can run from your local server itself if you want. So essentially, it's not, your data is with you. And what are the devices you are using? Your phone, your old phone. Or if you want a new phone, you can just probably walk to Walmart and get a $39 Android phone. You might want to flash it with a new ROM. Now, now comes the interesting part. All this context comes from smartphone device API. And I'm not actually running or creating an app where I'm actually accessing a native API. 
we're assessing the environment using web APIs. That's where Mozilla comes in or works in. So these are everything I did was in Firefox OS because I had the device running like with me. But the same things are available. Most of the things are available in Android. A little less amount of things are available in iOS. That was my reason of giving the screenshot in specifically one in Android, one in iOS, that you can do it in those devices as well. So these are physical APIs. Some of them I utilized. Most of them I have not. You can do awesome, wonderful things, which I don't even probably imagine now with these. So we have accelerometer orientation, proximity detection, ambient light detection, power, and battery. Just imagine, the power battery gives me that if my power is going on or off. The ambient light will tell you if at night you are not at home, somebody turns the light on, who, like, obviously you are not at home. Proximity, I have not come with a good uh, use case for that, but yeah, maybe you can. <coughs> These are media APIs. The most important or most the interesting part I did was with the microphone. Uh, we uh, there is another demo I made where you can just you can just keep use the gate user media, keep the camera running, and use another server to stream and see if there is any change in the room and just record the, whatever is going on. That is also part of what you can do. All of these are available as part of web APIs, not an APO API. So among these, I have not found a good use of NFC yet, but Bluetooth is really interesting. So the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi actually tells you a lot of interesting story. One, I just told that if I just scan Bluetooth, I find a lot of new people. Another interesting part in Wi-Fi. So I kept uh, this app running almost like a month just because of the microphone, but it also collected all the Wi-Fi devices it was scanning. I didn't, that was not my intention, but when I got the data, I found out that, okay, there are these new Wi-Fi's available. There is a missed Wi-Fi available from this day. And there are exact same day, I have these, these, these new Wi-Fi's available. And I have the signal strength. So first, with the Wi-Fi name, I'm like, okay, somebody new moved in, or probably somebody bought in Nest. But with the signal strength, now I know probably the radius from where they are, and since I have more or less good idea where my device is, like my router is sitting, I know the decimal strength of that. It is not a good guess because of walls and everything, but you have pretty much good guess it should be in your apartment complex at least or in the same building, otherwise it won't pick it up. So these are very interesting things. And so these are network APIs, They so Probably, probably use cases will be the devices talking to each other, not good use, use case I have. But all these are available through web. Now, what you need to play around with all these right now? So just an old smartphone, any smartphone actually, which, can, which has a browser. So almost every smartphone. Uh, a JavaScript web app. So um, that's the easiest thing I could pick up to learn, okay, how to code in JavaScript, go to Mozilla Developer Network, see sample codes, and just build the app. And now look around. There are a lot of things to look around, and you will get a lot of things to experiment with. So the reason I used Firefox OS was it was very easy to get low-level API access. The similar things can be done using Android and uh, iOS if you want to package a native app, phone gap maybe, but Android mostly allows you to do it just by web application itself. Now, these are the API triggers, kind of something, some, some other things I talked about. So the battery API gives you power outage, accelerometer can, I won't go about earthquake, but theft, but yeah, that is a possible use case, at least, yeah, theoretically. So Bluetooth is presence absence, or a lot of other things you can mesh uh, inside it. Wi-Fi is what I found out, neighborhood. <laughs> uh, microphone also presence <coughs> absence, or in my case, grandma monitoring tool. And camera, presence of cat. So what are the interactions? So this is a two-part application. So one is just the application running in your phone. So you have just to visit the web page once. 
And you might tell that I if I just like keep the web, I have to just visit the website and keep it on, or like again drag it to home and keep the like web page on. Then what is the function of it? So actually, right now with progressive web app and service workers and web push notification, you don't even need to do that. Just visit the page once from your phone where you want to want the phone to monitor it. And from the other phone or device where you want to get notifications, just visit the page once, give it permission. It will give you push notifications itself. Or since we are using a real phone to monitor, it can SMS you. It will have SMS plan. Or maybe a slack box. Now, initially, for a very happy project, we were trying to use IFT to make a channel. <coughs> and later I realized that might not be a very good use case when uh, I want to showcase it as a like going out of the world garden from proprietary and I'm showing everything and later I'm telling you oh, you have to use IFT to make a channel that it doesn't sound good so I found Hugin which is an open source project also free and open source project and uh, it kind of does the same thing IFT does and you can set it up your own server or own home and it can interact with the web APIs it does the exact same thing of IFTT. If something, then do something. So it can handle the interaction for you. So your sensors are giving the sensing data and everything, the web app is collecting them through the device APIs, and Eugene is processing and just not even processing. If something happens, while you put the threshold and it, it sends you the <coughs> notification. <coughs> so since this is not supposed to be just a talk, here is the code. Uh, you can uh, run it in your machine, or you can just try and hack with it. I just updated the license last night to make it like proper free and open source. <laughs> and a uh, lot of things I got to know uh, about running this, so I had to see if it confirms to Liberches. And yeah, so see the code, hack around with it, do <coughs> cool things, and just drop me a note if you do something cool, and I will be super happy to know. So the code is fairly documented. Uh, you will find more comments than code probably inside it. I'm a bad coder, so don't see the code quality. And uh, yeah. So IoT is not a product. It's the environment. So build with the so build whatever you want. You have the all the APIs available in open web. You have web page, you have JavaScript. Now is the best time to build it. <coughs> Thank you. So that is my Twitter handle. If you can <laughs> Thank you. If you want to get in touch with me, just mail me or like just do my shout in Twitter, and I'll be super happy to know if you guys build anything on it. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah. So security, how does this information, how is it processed, what networks does it go through in that? Um, yeah, so, uh, this one, uh, so the phone actually connects to your normal internet. There is no security in that part. It connects to your normal internet or Wi-Fi. The data is not getting uh, transferred uh, anywhere, just the triggers are getting transferred. So if something happens, the web app, I mean, the web app you can run in your local server, so it just tells, okay, do something. So you can send you push notification, notification. So that's about it. But we do have something else, which I gave talk in, in like last month in Open IoT Summit, where we have a separate system where all your data kind of goes through like a channel inside your router where it tries to protect you. So that's a like different topic. But yeah, here your data is with you. That's the only like peace of mind you get. Yeah. Oh, this is in response to him. If you're using an old smartphone, well, like if it was outdated, then you'd still be dealing with the old smartphone. So obviously having something on web, uh, some sort of JavaScript app on the browser, it doesn't change that. But you know, maybe yeah. a good mix of stuff. Yeah, just that's, I mean, the app is not exposed. You can run it with your own server. But yeah, you're still connected to the internet. So if anyone can somehow do something, so yeah, they will be able to. Yeah. 
Actually, there is. So uh, Watson has a lot of data. What uh, I mean, uh, so they have they have a specific platform where they have these like property software running in phone. They do the exact same thing just with their own software. And Watson crunches the data, and they have like ready-made triggers available with that. I'm not essentially sure if you have a, like open data set where you can just compare with your result and see. Okay, just is. This threshold passes do something. For me, for the microphone, I had to run it for me myself, uh, like a month, to see what is useful for me. Like what, what are my triggers than others? Uh, yeah, so that's about it. I don't know if there are like different data sets available, but I know there has been work and it, it is there. Just I don't know if it's open or not. Thank you. Uh, what is the, what Um, can you repeat again? Is the data speed for the acceleration sensor API comparable to audio, the audio API, and do we have to go through the basically for the local channel? Yeah, so, uh, so that is kind of a problem. So, for example, when I did the microphone uh, experiment, uh, there are two things I did. First, I just collected it on the phone not real time, later I analyzed it. I tried to do a time series and stuff like that, which was awesome because I had full data but not useful in real time. In real time, my Firefox OS was not capable to do that, so I plugged it in with a laptop and did the data analysis part there, then it worked fine. But uh, yeah, if you want to do it real time, I'm assuming you have to like uh, do a lot of cut or something like that. So the streaming, so it collects the data and the streaming is pretty good. Uh, but the phone doesn't, at least my phone didn't have the capability or I didn't, I couldn't write something on the phone to analyze it. Well, I can analyze it, well, I can. Um, but to, but Collection? To, yeah. Is, is so uh, like I said, the first part I didn't transport it at all. I was just storing in the de device and later taking it. The second part I was transporting by ADB, uh, I mean, direct connection to my uh, laptop. Then it connected like pretty fine. I didn't get a like, uh, timeout or a too much. But uh, if you're doing, probably doing, gonna do it for through network, it might be problematic. <coughs> I haven't tried that. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, I just want to know how, uh, how we match up your app at the uh, you know, main or something. Oh, uh, if you and go. I tried to, uh, to load it uh, from a uh, PowerPoint to the app with the app. Um, uh, so, are you fi trying to find the GitHub repo or like trying to. Yes, I have found it. Oh, you are trying to find the repo, right? Yes, I, I have done. I, I have the Yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you run it, right? Oh no, no. You, so uh, it won't run you in your uh, desktop right now. So you have to package. I mean, you have to run it in your phone. Okay. Yeah. So there is a manifest you will see, and it needs some like permission to access those physical APIs. So you won't be able to run it directly just by visiting that web page. So. Okay. Uh, Oh, yeah, that's fine. And you have to connect it to the IFTT. So uh, if you go to uh, the app.js and there's a context.js, you will see where you have to put the key and everything. Okay. Uh, maybe I can come and like show you later. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the app.js. Yes. Yeah, and uh, context.js, so there are portions where you have to put the key, like IFTT mega channel key. 
and if you put Hugin, then how you like set it up? So you have to connect these services, right? I can guide you. Yeah. Right. One other question. Um, I know that there was some consideration that um, like the battery life API is going to get more restricted going forward, and I could potentially see some of these other ones being more restricted. Do you, does this affect it? I guess I don't know the, the context and the nuances of how this restriction would work. So is this going to affect how you uh, your the, thing you're doing? The battery API right now probably won't. At least the attack they showed in Black Hat uh, for finger printing. Uh, that at least that fix won't uh, affect this one. But if you if we cannot get any data of my battery level at all, then it might affect. It. So the only thing I need is if the battery is it constant level or not. Okay. So the the pro problem with the fingerprinting was we could get like very granular level battery data. So how many percent and like with very good accuracy. That along with a lot of other things made it easier to uh, made it possible to fingerprint people even behind uh, like certain programs. Now, if we don't have that much granular level, it becomes pretty big. So I don't know what the patch is planned, but if it completely strips out battery percentage level, then yeah, that's a problematic for this one. But even if I get the like level that if it's go growing or going down or just the level, then it should go. I mean, it should be fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, I cannot comment on like which, uh, if it's perfect or not, but yeah, you can do it. I mean, it's possible to do that, and it's, uh, I mean, if you, uh, a lot of apps use that. So you can do, I mean, TCP data transfer is very like commonplace, and you can obviously do that. But I'm not sure for streaming data like this, how much uh, useful it is, but it works. For example, the gate user media or like transferring your camera feed, this works. They, they work like with pretty good accuracy. There are trade-offs, there are ways to deal with them, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so the, that code is not part of the GitHub, but uh, so if you, uh, I mean, if you just build a like, simple, uh, Take any tutorial, any demo, demo that where you can have, want to build a web RTC, just streaming application and everything. It accepts the camera, right? So, yeah. I mean, data transfer is not a problem. What is, maybe you said it earlier, maybe I missed it. What are you doing in your PhD? What are you doing sure? uh, I'm part of uh, Habanero uh, Extreme Skill Computing, so I'm doing a little bit like uh, GPU. Parallelization, but right now I'm uh, so more specifically in web virtual reality. So web VR and trying to speed them up because especially it's still a JavaScript, even with worker it's still so trying to speed things up. Thank you.